Hello everyone. Today we're talking about art, science, and technology. We're going to start off with Anthony Gormley, who's someone we also started off uh, the semester with, but I also, I think I promised you we'd see him again. And this series of work is called the Quantum Cloud uh, series. And really using um, scientific uh, or, uh, physics uh, as the inspiration here. And he's got kind of a nice short artist statement. So I just want to read it to you real quick. How can you convey the fact that the presence of someone is greater or different from their appearance? The domains allowed me to evoke the internal space of the body as a field, but are still bound to an invisible skin. I want to extend or ignore the skin. The quantum clouds continue the matrix of domains into the outer space through the continuation of branching connections, positioning the original body within a wider field. It is an open question that quantum clouds, whether the body is emerging from the chaotic energy field or the field of the body. So, um, not the best read, I apologize, but I think you get the picture. And I think they're uh, kind of um, direct, but uh, you know, fairly well done and diverse in the way that he um, approached them. This is a, an interesting piece where some people, uh, you know, initially are like, wait, how is this art? Uh, isn't it just science or, um, but I think it's the way that she went about it uh, really was kind of with the toolbox of an artist and then the way that she pre presents it also. Um, this is kind of uh, a little arrangement that she had outside of a TED talk that she did. Um, but what's interesting about the mushroom burial suit is that each one of those little kind of um, bits of yarn are inoculated with mycelium that uh, she figured out will break down the toxins in the, in the human body. And she really focused on this uh, work because she saw just how many pounds of mercury were um, put into the atmosphere every year through cremation. And so she didn't think it was a very sustainable uh, burial practice. And she thinks that uh, our culture has kind of a way of denying death. And that this is uh, what she sees as a step in, in the right direction to uh, not only embrace death, but rebirth because your, um, e your body is consumed by the mushrooms and then um, turned into, it, it filters the toxins out and then uh, you can re-enter the, the world, the earth in a, a more sustainable way. The Hive by Wolfgang Buttress. Uh, this is a pretty cool piece. Um, I'm just going to play a short video to, so that you can really see it in action because it's something that, it's not static. You really got to see it in motion or be there to, uh, to appreciate it, I think.
So I think it's pretty beautiful. I hope you think so too. I should correct myself and say that uh, it's not actually in motion, <laughs> right? It's not connect sculpture, but um, being able to see kind of the camera move around it and some of the lights as they um, kind of dim or, um, or get brighter. And just to kind of reiterate that that sculpture is actually connected to a beehive, right? So I think it's a, a pretty amazing example of art and technology, um, or art, science, and technology uh, to uh, kind of blow up a hive in a visual way. Uh, the colony is kind of being the selfless thing as well. Um, so uh, if anyone ever gets to go, please let me know. It's, uh, it's one that I'd like to see in person. Uh, let's kind of stick on the the note of bees for just a moment. Heather Green, a portrait of 100 native bees. Um, she's really interested in just how we think about the honeybee and we think about how important the honeybee is. And we sometimes get sidetracked with the fact that um, there are, you know, a huge variety of native bees as well that uh, we don't necessarily um, help out, right? I think uh, there's some kind of points to some research about uh, dandelions and how if you really want to help bees, it's don't don't poison the dandelions because it's the first flower that comes up in the spring and, and the bees really um, like those first flowers and sometimes we're poisoning um, colonies that way. And so it is, uh, you know, fairly scientific. You got your uh, scientific name down there and uh, all kind of lettered out, but she arranges them in a rather non-scientific way, right? If, we, if this was a science exhibit, it'd probably be gridded out in some um, form or another. So I think she kind of leaves the door open there for exploration a little bit. And uh, kind of an interesting way of looking at didactics as well. So, uh, this is gonna be another just short video, uh, sorry. It's a song of our warming planet, and I know that this is uh, music, but, you know, music is art, too. And uh, a lot of times we have musicians in class, so I just kind of want to um, throw in that way. And I think it's uh, good. I was in a class with Professor Scott St. George in the geography department. And at one point he posted a slide advertising for interns in his dendrochronology lab. And I was lucky enough to, to get that job. He came to me with a set of data with the task of turning it into a piece of music. And we wound up with a song of our warming planet. In the piece of music, each, each note will correspond to a year. And then the pitch of that note will represent the temperature of that year. So then these really high pitches that would mean a warmer year and then the lower pitches would be a cooler year. The data comes from the Goddard Institute for Space Studies at NASA. It's a compilation of global annual surface air temperatures. Climate scientists have a standard toolbox to communicate their data. And what we're trying to do is we're trying to add another tool to that toolbox, another way to communicate these ideas to the people who might get more out of this than out of maps, graphs, and numbers. Climate change is a defining issue of our generation, and it's still something that a lot of people don't fully understand. And what we're trying to do is to represent the music, sort of the immediacy and the importance that this issue has right now. And if we act on that, then maybe it won't be as much of an issue for the future.
So bear with me here. Um, pretty well done. I think there's a couple of things that uh, really stand out. It's just that they kind of emphasize that uh, if projections are um, on point, that uh, they'll produce a series of notes that are out of the range of human hearing. And then again, the way that the, kind of the graph kind of um, slides, you can see it here in the bottom left-hand corner, um, where we're kind of at the top end of the graph. Um, that uh, bottom left-hand corner, you can see where the it goes underneath value right there of the years so um, yeah kind of kind of well done uh, next of kin this is seeing extinction this is done by the same project uh, that uh, high water line was done um, in, the, in an earlier lecture um, called the canary project it's a bunch of art science um, pieces so if uh, if you're interested I really high, I really recommend you take a look uh, the canary project is kind of being a uh, a little play on words there for um, the canary in the coal mine. You know, they used to bring a bring a canary with them, and if the canary passed out or died, then they all knew they had to get out of there, or they were going to be um, soon to follow, right? And here are a bunch of um, kind of it's called seeing extinction, right? So it's a, it's an exhibit of um, mostly mammals that are on the on the brink or have gone extinct. So. Now this is a funny one, uh, maybe not funny at all to some people, but uh, is I guess it's just out there, um, the GFP bunny. And it's a work that is a creation of, uh, so it stands for Green Fluorescent Rabbit, Alba. Um, and it really get engaged a public dialogue generated by this project of, it was genetically modified to glow in the dark, right? So it, it, it was really ahead of its time. You can see that it started in 1998. And they're really thinking about, um, you know, the potential moral quandaries of genetically modifying something. And this really raised quite a stir. If, uh, if there's anyone in biology, uh, I'm sure this will come up at some point in your education. But, you know, in the past couple of years, I can't remember exactly, there's the first genetically modified babies, right? Um, this um, new technology called CRISPR. And it, the scientific community was really kind of up in arms at this uh, because it was said that it shouldn't be done on humans yet. And uh, so I believe he was a Chinese scientist and he went ahead and did it uh, to twin girls on, in their... I'm supposed to be now immune to AIDS. Um, so, it, you know, it could be a really great thing, um, but it can also be a really slippery slope that, uh, you know, genetically modifying human beings could be whether or not people start picking desirable traits or um, it, it, if it's not just reserved to kind of um, maybe say, uh, People being born immune to uh, polio, coronavirus, uh, you know, HIV, AIDS, stuff like that. So, I think I think you guys can all kind of come to your own conclusion on uh, how you see this being a, being an issue or not, and uh, just maybe respect kind of where this artist was in this time um, of, of doing this in 1998, kind of bringing this. A conversation of public discourse, whether or not you think it's art or not, um, or good art or not, and it's, it's up to you, right? Unseen Alchemist. Uh, this is some kind of interesting body pieces that uh, actually change color depending on who's wearing them and, um, and depending on their mood, uh, they say. And this is... Um, a work that you know you might critique to say that you have to read about a little bit to really understand um but i also think that there's something really intuitive about it. this building was being torn down and uh, the artist wanted to create an artwork that kind of slowly started spiraling into something else moving away from its creator uh, and it kind of you get little glimpses um as it evolves so um, there's kind of one piece uh, of this puzzle that I think is most interesting. But uh, 
the artist kind of said, I'm interested in, in kind of letting go in a certain way, the self-organizing systems try to either find uh, or not find symbiosis. I try my best not to intervene with it, he says. I think that um, the, that's a kind of an interesting notion, but this is perhaps kind of, you know, the, the, the piece of the puzzle that uh, people kind of enjoy most. And this is like a little Brancusi sculpture as a shell, right? And so it, I think it does a really good job of displaying this kind of human nature culture interface, right? Um, as animals will often use what we've left behind. And by making one of the most famous sculptures of all time, um, just, you know, something that uh, this crustacean has no idea what it is, right? It's just using it because it, it's what it's found and what it needs is um, kind of, I don't know, to me it's kind of genius in some way. I just kind of want to show you there at Christie's auction house being sold for $51 million, right? So it's kind of crazy. So it's one of the most famous sculptures of all time. And uh, the way that he kind of embeds this in the work um, almost as like some sort of post civilization moment. The Harrisons are an art science group that um, they really look at uh, climate change and uh, artistic ways of going about it. And the exhibits end up looking a little bit like this, a series of um, maps that you can explore and usually some wall didactics. And this is a piece out in California. And the following piece here is a Dead River Detail. And this was a restoration project they did near Santa Fe. Um, and, oh, no. How did it go away? There we go. Um, so they worked with the local community to tell the stories of um, the natives that live there about the river itself. Um, so there's kind of uh, hist the history had been kind of over, had been kind of written over as um, the river was over allocated, overused until what they called uh, kind of died. Um, so they used these symbols that you see in the gallery in the sand, um, create big structures out there in the river to help slow the water down and it actually um, worked. Right? So these kind of simulated beaver dams and uh, slowed the water down, rose the water table and the, the river is actually kind of uh, living again. I mean, not thriving in the same way, but it actually does flow. Um, so kind of a cool thing. And there's a, we're not going to watch the video on it because it's kind of long and dated. Um, but uh, they were kind of at the forefront of this environmental kind of um, art movement. John Ryan Brubaker is a printmaker and this stuff, uh, he kind of nailed the process. He's from the south, the, uh, southeast where there's a lot of coal mines and a lot of the rivers out there are uh, contaminated by the coal mines. You see on the right, um, really, really rich in minerals there. And he wanted to find ways to kind of um, embrace it. So he being, uh, he's kind of a photographer, printmaker. He started uh, exposing his prints in the water and getting really interesting results. I think that kind of sepia tone is really beautiful, speaks to the contamination of the river. And uh, he thinks that they're going to kind of evolve and change color over time. So I think that also is kind of interesting when you look at uh, efforts to clean the river and what it might change. The Laboratory of Dilemmas. This is another Venice Biennale piece. Um, There's the Pavilion of Greece there. So I'm just going to watch this real quick. We are conducting here in this building one of the most important experiments in the history of biology. My colleagues from different countries, being world's best scientists, are working here for the future of humanity. It is my great honor and pleasure to present to you Today, the first results of our study. I think I am an idealist. I'm reading again the suppliants by Eschylus. Do you know the king's dilemma? So 
so yeah it might be a little cryptic um but what this piece really is trying to point out if you were to watch it a couple more times which i encourage you to that that is a very short version it's like the trailer of the piece but what the piece what the work is really trying to point out is how sometimes we get blinded by the the desire for scientific progress and overlook maybe the humanity of the situation, right? Uh, there's a really kind of interesting TV show on Netflix called uh, OA, uh, O, uh, just the two, two letters, O-A. Um, and it, it kind of talks about, you know, the scientist who's totally blinded by the progress um, that he thinks he's making. and uh, kind of the inhumane acts that come along with it. Um, the the Nazis also, um, you know, they were, you know, you know doing many things uh, inhumane, but one of them was kind of trying to progress scientific knowledge in medicine. And, uh, and, and there's a lot of um, things that are still, still known today from that. And sometimes um, people will critique um, that that it's an often critique of the medical field in general that uh, that they don't recognize uh, how those how that knowledge came about. So, Mark Dion is a really interesting artist who he I like to think of him as like a collage or assemblage artist. He doesn't often ever make anything himself but his eye for um, putting material together I think is really a genius uh, or just a beautiful thing and this is a tree coming out of the Pacific Northwest um, just right off a highway that was um, falling he was watching it waiting for it to fall over and uh, once it did uh, they went in and, and grabbed it and they had this huge greenhouse waiting for it um, and put it in and it's just all it is is a tree that is living and evolving so yeah you might say it's just a piece of you know maybe it's just a greenhouse maybe it's a maybe it's just a tree right but um he's done he's He's done a kind of uh, interesting thing here too, where he's gotten a, a little field guide together to the wildness of this Seattle tree. And uh, it talked about, you know, making multiple booklets as different plants come about and different bugs come about, but it, it's just doing its own thing, right? But it's been reframed outside of the rainforest and inside of a greenhouse for us to look at it in different kind of contextual light. Mia Hunt, um, ambiguity and analog, uh, she's a geographer. Um, I think she had a PhD in geography and then she got into art later, but she's really interested in kind of the urban environment and it makes these pinhole cameras that capture um, a place over time. Exquisite Creatures, uh, this is a piece that I just got turned on to uh, recently. And I think it was in Portland last year at a museum. Yeah, it was Portland. Just arranging insects in a really aesthetic way rather than kind of going the typical entomology way of, uh, you know, in rows, single boxes, scientific names just looking at them for the beauty that they have, right? Mandalas and different geogra like, um, geographic, <clears throat> kind of geometric patterns. This is uh, wild. You guys have got to Google these names and see them um, in kind of live. Nervous system of a human. This, it was born from a joke of the guy uh, his girlfriend drew nervous system smoking a cigarette. And he's like, that's a good challenge. He's a photographer um, and did it. <laughs> but uh, there's, there's some other pieces of like the nervous system like growing, but I just couldn't do it live in the PowerPoint. Uh, encourage you to take a look. Um, I do just want to take the second to take a look at Colossal. It's a website hopefully you've all looked at by now. Um, but they just have like a science section. This one's illustration and science. 
Yeah. And it's just a really sweet resource to look through. You can kind of figure out what kind of work you're going to like uh, or you you do like, and you can kind of look at it by sections. When, and so we, we have the subsections, photography and science. Um, sometimes it just gets like straight science more or less. Uh, there's a little time lapse. Um, so just scroll through a couple of these here. I just wanna, I want you to see the aesthetic of the website as well. Uh, I kind of like this one, 50th anniversary of uh, landing on the moon. And they're taking data from um, NASA and printing these little, like, I think they're concrete um, pieces of the moon. So you can have your own little replica. I'm kind of like a art science history, sometimes uh, fanatic. And I was just thinking, man, I'd love to have one of those. Um, so you kind of see a few different, a few different ways they're going about that. But it's really uh, an amazing website it's being updated you know, daily. And you can see how we got you know, art, design, craft, photography, interviews, and then more. I mean, look at this. This is amazing. So uh, hopefully you could find something that you like. And, you know, we just looked at street art, see what we got going on there right now. Um, so hopefully you can take a look through this and a little, oh yeah, Banksy just did this. I was loving it um, of his, in his bathroom. But uh, hopefully you take a moment to really uh, dig through Colossal. All right, back to your regularly scheduled program. This is another artist who is really into process. Uh, and this is a good piece to show that he it's titled we are all astronauts um and it's composed of world globes that have been kind of stripped clean of their geographic information right you can see how it's like sanded down and the artist is really looking at how um maps and borders have changed over time and he so he sanded it away kind of um highlighting the variety of success of the kind of shifting geopolitical boundaries uh using what he called like an international sandpaper that he made from um, mineral samples from all the un recognized countries so the united nations right you got um, minerals of um, kind of silica sand from all those countries put on a sandpaper and then sanded these globes down i mean i think there's something kind of strangely poetic about that we're going to move into a little more like art uh, and technology type of a, um, you know, it's that last third here. And this video is, does a good job of just going over a few. From paintings to photographs to film, artists have always been quick to adapt to new forms of expression. And in the modern day, technology is helping visionaries take their experimentation even further. From technical installations to virtual reality tours, there's a whole heap of boundary-pushing art to be found online. Five, four, three, two, one. And we begin with a spectacular ballet created by Japanese advertising firm MicroAd. Dubbed Sky Magic, the performance art at a distance looks like fireflies dancing in the dusk. But on closer inspection, those fireflies are actually drones packed with LED lights, a whole 16,000 of them, all set against the backdrop of beautiful Mount Fuji in Japan. The whole effect is entrancing, and it seems viewers around the world agree. 
with the video receiving over 340,000 views on Vimeo alone. And we're transported from the pretty to the downright sublime. Canadian studio Irregular fuse arts and technology in some very progressive ways. Their installation Control No Control once again takes advantage of LED lights, but this time with an interactive element. Placed in public squares, the sculpture inspires passers-by to use their hands and bodies to play with the sound and graphics running through the cube structure. But one artist focused entirely on internalizing their creativity. Conceptual artist Lisa Park used technology to manipulate water with her brain. For her piece, Unoya, Lisa used a specialized device called the NeuroSky EEG headset to transform her brain activity into streams of data. Her brain waves and eye movements were monitored and then transformed into sound waves. These waves then emerged through five speakers placed under shallow dishes of water, which then vibrate in various patterns. And Lisa isn't the only one experimenting with such fusions. Artist Tiaru Leo also blends art and technology in a mind-bending way. Her magic forest installation brings sunlight and nature into a dreary Shanghai metro station. By wrapping a ring of LED lights around the station pillars, schools of illuminated 3D printed butterflies sail across the station's sweeping walls. The result is a multi-sensory experience in which it seems as if beams of light are peeking through the clouds on a gloomy day. TRU explains the process of selecting technologies for her art pieces. In order to find the right media to express each piece of work, we always do several things. Keep up to date with different technologies and materials and understand how these technologies work, what are the advantages and disadvantages, whether it is in line with our concept. After exploring all those things, we then make an informed decision concerning our approach and method. Now to an artist who is using technology to explore the beauty of physicality. Tobias Gremler's visionary new series recreates the graceful moves of Kung Fu. But rather than using the motion of real life, the whole creation is formed solely with motion capture and digital manipulation. Gremler slowed down eight animated moves that were recreated using stretched fabrics and rolling metallic threads. A true visionary taking advantage of the technological landscape in order to turn his idea into a reality. And clearly many have been excited to gaze into his imagination with the video reaching over 550,000 views online. But it's not only hardware that is inspiring artists, but software too. Chad Knight utilized photo sharing app Instagram as a playground for his digital art. Tasking himself with a 365-day challenge, Chad wanted to post a new piece of art every single day. And the results are bewildering. Featuring brightly colored skulls and random creatures, Knight's pictures create a world reminiscent of critically acclaimed artist Salvador Dali. Although unlike Knight, Dali did not have 21st century technology to display his work. Fortunately for Dali, a museum in Florida has decided to take on this task for him. The Dali Museum has created a 360 degree virtual reality tour, which includes elements from his famous paintings, Angelus and the Lobster. It's to coincide with the museum's exhibition, which explores his work similarities with Walt Disney. And they've even transported the surrealist master into the world of virtual reality. Part of the immersive exhibition sees visitors able to explore the world of Dali through an Oculus Rift headset. From the stroke of a paintbrush to the click of a mouse, technology is helping to take art to the next level. 
whether it's helping the creator to realize their vision or pushing them to try new forms of expression, digital art is thriving. And the best part? Most of it is available from the comfort of your very own computer. So I know some of you out there are experimenting with digital art a little bit, and I just kind of want to encourage you to keep doing so. Whether it's you know 3D printing um, in in different like in different softwares, right? There's different drawing and painting softwares that you can do right on your iPad uh, or you know tablet or what have you. Uh, and and uh, I think that those are pretty exciting uh, design project ideas. I've also gotten some really hilarious like gifts. Um, and uh, I think that, you know, as long as we're being uh, mindful of course content, that's a totally appropriate way to go. Um, but I just kind of, you know, want to sum up some of the things that are really taking the art world, uh, that the art world's really taking advantage of, right? 3D printing, computer programming, drones, robotics, artificial intelligence, virtual reality, and uh, don't forget social media. And we're going to see it's not just a way to share your work. All right. So I'm um, not going to go into 3D printing too much. I think we all know what it is, but uh, I do want to kind of point out ceramics, upper right-hand corner. is It's changing the way that uh, some ceramicists make things um, right now. And um, and also the digital grotesque, this was uh, said to be the first 3D printed room. And we're now seeing homes um, 3D printed. Um, I'm not going to go into that too much right now, but I really, there it is. Somehow I went right over that. Um, but this, these are uh, some ceramic vessels, right? 3D printed and uh, pretty, pretty amazing, really. Pretty wild. Uh, and it's still kind of in the elegant phase of, of printing, um, kind of excited uh, as the technology becomes e increasingly commonplace to see uh, how it starts to challenge um, as well, but push past that kind of aesthetic notion. Um, this is a really weird one, but it's kind of fun to try sometimes. Jenny O'Dell, the Google drawing game. Um, so you make a drawing, you take a photo or a screenshot, drag it into your uh, Google image search bar, and then you draw whatever comes up the first image. Um, under the visually similar, and then you take a photo and then uh, drag that into your Google image search bar and repeat. And uh, so we have some uh, kind of crazy examples here, right? So um, give it a try if uh, this is your kind of thing. It's like a game of telephone with Google. Um, so it can be kind of funny, right? Uh, and this is just an artist who does wacky stuff, right? The, yeah, people younger than me explaining how to do things. I just think it's really funny, uh, honestly. But uh, yeah. And last but not least, the Craigslist farewells. Oh man, Heart, some, there's some heartbreakers and there's some weird ones too, but I'm just hoping it goes to a wonderful woman who deserves it. Proposal gone wrong, oof. Um, sad to say, but everything must go, stuff like that. Michael Wolf, these are, um, I, the Google, Google Street View has got some wacky stuff out there and, uh, he calls them a series of unfortunate events and, uh, yeah, take it away, the beware of dog, right? Um, okay, we missed one. There we go. And the pigeon, that's pretty good. Um, there's a lot of really good wildlife stuff caught on Google Earth. So anyway. Facebook hacking, hacking uh, Monopoly trilogy. Pretty funny. Uh, I'm just going to show the news. Actually, uh, it, it might not be funny at all to some of you. It might be horrifying. Um, but uh, maybe interesting for most of us. Like him, for her, want to arrange a date? Lovelyfaces.com lets you peruse profiles and admire photos. The web's producers went through a million Facebook profiles and chose 250,000. The problem is this isn't really a dating website. The site's producers call it social commentary on the lack of privacy in the age of Facebook. We talked to Wired.com's Ryan Single via Skype. They went and they scraped Facebook, basically took the information people had publicly accessible and took 250,000 people's information and put them all on a dating site without their permission. Ever heard that term, scraping? That's the collection of information, but without the illegal element of hacking. 
projects like this um, kind of are good for us to kind of stop and think a little bit like, you know, how is it we want to be on the internet? What, what don't, why don't we have better choices about how public we are and whether my name and my photo is out there? We came out to show some people the Lovely Faces website. As a dating site, definitely thumbs down. But the opinions got a lot stronger once we explained how those profiles were collected or scraped. It's kind of shocking, actually. It feels like they're invading your privacy. Now I want to set everything to private and just tell my friends I'll find them, don't find me. They're distorting information. Distorted information with some potential for damage. Imagine if you found your husband or girlfriend on the site. <laughs> That'd be good for the relationship is what I'm no, saying. Oh, yeah, that could cause, you know, drama. Lovely Faces producers are based in Berlin. Facebook isn't amused, but so far no legal volley to bring the website down. If you find your picture, they claim they'll take it down immediately. Susan Hirostuna, Fox 11 News. Wow, right? Um, so just a good reminder that uh, whatever you post, upload to Facebook or Instagram is pretty much public, right? Kind of kind of crazy. Moving right along into some more surveillance stuff. I weigh way piece here. Um, we got to watch this one on. Uh, yeah, I can't I can't pull it up. I couldn't embed this. So. experience is both with your senses but also with your connotations you have more and more your traces can be easily traced or found out by higher superior uh, authorities how do you bring together with your own history with your own biography those uh, experiences together and to have a higher alertness on this We're at the Park Avenue Armory taking a look at Hansel and Gretel, which is a site-specific installation by the architects Jacques Herzog, Pierre Demeron, and the artist Ai Weiwei. The installation takes over the armory's cavernous drill hall and uses technology to comment on surveillance in public space. As visitors move through the installation, they're recorded using infrared cameras. The images are then broadcast via live stream and projected onto the floor of the armory. How can we offer something which can give a new definition about today's condition? Architectural interpretation is very much defined by how people is going to use it, how people experience it. It's uh, really a public space. We see it as a part of a Manhattan life, the very cosmopolitan life. Jacques and Pierre and Ai Weiwei have spent a lot of time actually designing and thinking about public space and the way the public interacts with space. And I think that we used to think of public space as, as free. That's not true anymore. Now public space, because of surveillance, is much more dangerous than we thought it was. That metaphor, their name of it, Hansel and Gretel, is kind of perfect because the idea is that Hansel and Gretel live next to a forest that they probably played in woods every day. And then they find out that there's actually menace in the forest. And I think that's sort of what they're trying to say. All of us as human beings, with all our senses, we would like to experience the space also acoustically. And that's when the drone came up as a very important element of the project. You know, this humming, but also the wind that they are uh, producing is adding something additional. And ideally, we would also want to catch the noise, which is in the space. If someone screams or shouts or sings, that this should be recorded as the images are being recorded. I think the, to come back to the title, Hans and Gretel, the, the people project their traces. So that adds something scary, but also playful. When we came here, I think that neither you, Wei Wei, nor Pia and I expected that people are even dancing. So it adds something playful, which I think is nice. That it's really about moving, you know, and behaving and doing things that are not expected. As an artist in China, my life uh, have a very different conditions. I've been heavily surveillance through the internet or my telephone being tapped and the real people following me wherever I go. And uh, so those become part of my life. You always see yourself or a record somewhere or being recorded the way you can never even 
imagine or, or, or cannot really comprehend why that's necessary. But this is today's life, and willingly or not, we are being recorded. So I, I do know that there is definitely a kind of rebuttal to to their argument of being recorded. And I, I've um, I've read uh, different studies and, and listened to podcasts and say the more surveillance we have, the safer our cities will actually be because uh, police don't have a bird's eye view; they can see when where something goes wrong. Um, they're able to track uh, track the crime easier. Um, but then on the re on the reverse of that, there is you know uh, the more that we program um, security systems or surveillance systems with our current judicial laws, that they might say that they're uh, engendered or um, maybe racially biased. Uh, so you know it, it's uh, it's kind of a difficult conversation, right? Uh, I'm, I'm going to be kind of moving through these because I'm, I'm realizing that I'm uh, kind of going over on time. Um, but these are some computer generated uh, pieces on like from famous nude paintings. Um, so there's like robot art competitions right now. And um, so I just kind of want to like ask you, you know, like, is it art if it's created by a robot, right? Like, does, does it have to be, does art have to be created by a human? Um, and what happens when art is increasingly mechanized. Um, I heard something very poetic recently. It's like the job of science is to make us feel like very small sometimes, um, in insignificant even. And then the job of art in the humanities is to kind of make us feel uh, empowered, right? So, uh, I, and then, I, so I guess I, I wonder, you know, what those people would say about artists and you know created by robots or artificial intelligence right like where do we where do we think intelligence lies and uh if uh, maybe in you know if an artificial intelligence system is created off of an artist is it still that artist's work then you know if that if that ai has all of it all of its uh, all of the artists kind of ways of thinking um, in music, right? We, we definitely see this happening already. Amper is an artificial intelligence composer, performer, and producer that empowers you to instantly create and customize original music for your content. Um, you know, so, so what, you know, I guess I just ask, in a world that's increasingly mechanized, what, is, what do you think this is going to do to the art world? Do you think it's still art? Um, and, and just like, it's a humanities question, right? For us all to just think about um alternate realities right we're gonna more and more vr definitely more and more vr and i think that um coronavirus will be a historic moment for a lot of reasons i think industry is going to shift um we're seeing it already uh, with kind of oil um, kind of oil projections but we're seeing museums also really start to think hard about how you are able to experience a museum in a time when they're going to be closed for uh, potentially a long time, right? And uh, so th there's a lot, there's a big push. We saw the Salvador Dali kind of virtual reality thing just a moment ago. There's a big push right now about how to augment the reality, right, of a um, museum. And if maybe that, you know, they've already been really um, pushing the cell phone use in, in a museum. Maybe they're going to be bringing it right to your cell phone. Um, so how does that change? So.